Hi, I'm Lisa Peterson from Wealth Clinic. I used to be a financial advisor, or at least I went to college. I trained and got my MBA and probably combined have about 10 years of training in financial services and about 20 years of working in the financial services industry. And after all of that, I quit about 10 years ago. And at the time, nobody really understood why I made that change. And it's actually taken me a long time to be able to fully understand it. But today, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about that change and, and why I made it and um, why it was so important in my life because of what happened as a result and what I've learned since then. So I thought that if I could sort through my um, understanding of how it happened, it might help other people who are at a crossroad or you're not happy in what you're working on or you know you want to make a change, but it's really scary to you. So I thought by sharing my journey, it would be helpful to some people. So that's what I'm going to do. I think I'll start by saying that sometimes the bravest thing that we can do is to let go of what you've worked so hard to achieve. And I think that's what my story is all about. So if you are feeling stuck or you're questioning your path right now, the question that I think is really helpful to ask yourself is not how can I be more successful, but rather am I living a life that's true to myself? Am I living a life that brings me great fulfillment? So I thought it, it would, might be helpful for me to take you on my journey from this, this financial success to personal fulfillment and show you why sometimes it's just the most amazing decision to make it is starting over, to, to make that decision that you want to start over. And I feel like that's what I did. Before I quit, my job as a financial advisor, I was definitely one of the most qualified people I knew. Uh, people were really surprised. I mean, I was successful. I was at the top of my class and when I start new roles. And so when I left, people were surprised. Um, they couldn't understand why I'd walk away from the security, the benefits, the clients, the status. And over the years, people have asked me why I left. And it's not something that was really easy to explain because there was a lot behind it. Even recently, I'm on a one month road trip and my clients that I visited from like 20 years ago asked me like, why did you leave? And we never really understood it. What is it that you're doing now? And I was like, oh, that's a good question. You know, maybe I should revisit this. Maybe it'd be helpful for someone who's thinking about getting into financial services or maybe for someone who's, who's feeling stuck. So talking about my journey into finance, you know, when I first started studying finance back in the early 1990s, it was really driven by fear. I had this deep sense of scarcity inside, uh, like life wasn't safe. And I felt like if I wasn't careful, I'd struggle with money all my life. And I didn't want to spend my life worrying about money like my parents had. When I was growing up, money was a source of really deep stress and it, it really scarred me and it made me worried that I would be broke and I wanted to do everything possible to not be broke. And when I first started after undergrad, I, I had studied design and clothing and I worked for a, a designer in San Francisco and I was making minimum wage. And I remember thinking, ah, uh, this isn't a good sign. Like this is very similar to what your parents you know, did and following their passion, maybe you need to do something more legitimate. Maybe you need to get a real job and um, that pays the bills. And, and so I decided after a year of sort of struggling that I would go back to school and get my MBA. And I was pretty fascinated actually about money all my life. I was super curious about how money worked where it came from, why some people had more of it, why people, some people had less, why some people would make it and lose it, and then some people could keep it. And I was completely enamored by this topic. And so the more I learned, the more I realized how few people really understood money. 
And I thought that if I learned about money, then I would be able to help a lot of people that, that like myself with the, with this knowledge. So I remember though, after I finished my MBA, one of my first interviews out of college was with a financial advising firm and they did not think that I was a good fit. And they said, sorry, that's not going to work. And so I ended up going on a meandering path of getting a job in insurance and then working in marketing and then working in um, marketing and strategic development for a big, big bank and eventually working as a mortgage banker and then eventually becoming a financial advisor. It would take me 20 years to prove to myself and probably to um, the industry that I could do it. And it, it's funny how life works sometimes because that was not what I was thinking was what was going to happen. But along the way, I learned something important in this industry and that was that confidence is more important than knowledge. If you project, you know what you're talking about, people will believe you. But if you're not so sure, people will definitely not believe you. And that pretty much sums up the industry in general. I wasn't confident in myself enough. I wasn't confident enough in myself early on. So I had to learn how to become more confident to be able to sell financial advising to people later in life. But when I became, eventually became a financial advisor in 2011, I was in for a rude awakening. And while there may be, I, I know there are many financial advisors who are genuinely caring towards their clients and go above and beyond the call of duty for them. I discovered that this level of service that I think we all want from a financial advisor is often reserved for those with significant wealth typically a million dollars or more in investable assets or those who can get there in like five years because they're making a lot of money. But that represents only about 12 to 15% of the U.S. population. And so uh, that was really not why I, I had decided to go into financial advising. But I also want to say that after all my years and study and experience, um, I quickly discovered when I became an advisor that my knowledge wasn't the most important thing. In fact, financial advising, especially when you're first starting out, isn't so much about helping people as it is about making as many sales as you possibly can. And so there I was training alongside of, of people fresh out of college or with little life experience or financial knowledge. And it all came down to how well you could sell and didn't matter about my expertise. It mattered if you could sell, how good you are at selling. And looking back, I realized that sometimes knowing less actually made it easier to follow the, the sales protocol without questioning the system. Okay. Everything was incentivized for sales, not how well you helped people, but how much you sold. And as I saw what was really happening, I realized that the industry wasn't primarily about helping people. It was about making money from people. Sure, if clients benefited financially, that was awesome, but it wasn't the main goal that the industry was all about. And it deeply bothered me. I had a wealth of experience. I could help people in so many ways, but the system incentivized selling more, not helping more. And so for some clients, that was fine because they might not have invested at all without an advisor. And so I was able to make a difference for those people, of course. But most often the people who needed help the most were those with the least amount of money. And since advisors are paid based on assets under management, it didn't make financial sense to take on clients who were just starting out unless I was willing to potentially lose my job and probably go broke. So instead, you had to, or I had to focus on finding wealthy clients or getting them from other advisors. And when we would first work with people, we'd run these investment simulations showing how we could help them potentially get better returns. But these were just numbers, right? They were speculative at best. 
to get a client, you had to sell them on possibilities rather than certainties. I didn't really get that going in, including the fact that whatever happened in the markets, whether you know they go up or when they go down, uh, no matter the, the client would be the one at risk. So not the investment advisor, right? They get paid no matter what even though what they got paid would be less if someone lost a lot in their portfolio, it just seems so weird to me that it was all oriented around helping the advisor, you know, have a job versus helping people who are the, the customers build wealth. It started to feel like I was taking advantage of people's lack of knowledge about money and personal finance. So for those who didn't need like, the high asset threshold, I couldn't provide the level of service they needed because I was so busy trying to find people who did have more assets that would allow me to keep my job and, and make enough money to support myself. So then for the wealthy clients, I often felt like I was charging them more than the value I was creating compared to what they could do on their own, especially as the internet started to take off. And investment options like index funds and building portfolios, quite simply, with a trading account started to become so much more favorable because your costs were less and your potential for growth was far higher than paying the fees involved in mutual funds or advisory accounts. And so I was really, I was really torn between this this sort of moral dilemma was very upsetting to me. And I'd lie awake at night and I'd feel this sense of, of moral injury to my values. Like I knew if I kept doing it, it would eventually break me. I, I felt like, yeah, I should be able to support myself, but shouldn't feel like this is an ethical dilemma every time I go to work. I really wanted to make a difference. I wanted to educate people and help them take control of their financial lives I had no idea how to leave my career that I'd been working now for 25 years on. I felt very stuck, like that proverbial rock, between a rock and a hard place. And this internal conflict was really the beginning of a journey that would eventually lead me to make a big change in my life and career. And I knew that I needed to to do this, but then I was also the primary breadwinner for my family. And I couldn't figure out how to walk away from my career. We needed my benefits. This was back in 2013. Um, I don't think the Affordable Care Act had passed yet, but uh, we couldn't figure out you know, how to keep benefits, the stability, how to pay our bills, how to send my kids to college. And then at the end of 2013, life served me a major curveball that, that changed everything. And I talk about this in my book, The Mindful Millionaire, but I'll summarize what happened here. It was, it was Christmas of 2013 that caused me to realize how short and truly precious life is. I was sitting in my doctor's office when a man walked in with a large gun and he looked at me and he said, you might want to leave now. And as chaos erupted and he went into the back of the office, uh, there was a realization that he was serious, that he didn't have a good motive and um, chaos erupted. And we, many of us in the waiting room fled to the elevators. And I found myself facing this very real possibility that I might not get out of this situation alive. And in those moments of this intense fear and uncertainty, something profound happened to me. My life flashed before my eyes and I had what felt like an out-of-body experience. And I thought about my family. I thought about the possibility of never seeing them again. But more than that, I realized that just how much I wasn't truly living how much my fears from childhood and from, from all of my life had been holding me back, how much my scarcity mindset was keeping me totally frozen in living a life that wasn't really the one I wanted to be living. And, and I saw the truth of like who I really was and trying to get out of this building, I stepped into an elevator with several nurses from the office 
And for a few seconds, surrounded by the prayers of these strangers, I felt in that moment stripped of, of all feeling for just long enough to notice that I was more than my fear. Like all these internal stories of not being good enough, not being safe enough, not being enough were suddenly laid bare before me. And I could see the absolute ridiculousness of how I had been living. And I whispered these, these prayers for another chance, like promising to myself and, you know, to God that, that if I were to make it out alive, that I would live my life more fully, that I would not be so restricted by the fear that I had been holding on to all my life. And when I did survive this ordeal, I knew I had narrowly escaped death. Unfortunately, my brilliant, amazing doctor was killed in the shooting. Uh, a few other people were shot and the shooter uh, turned the gun on himself and killed himself. Um, it was it was a horrible day and going to the police station and realizing that he had been killed and just realizing how precious life is, right? That, that we only have a certain amount of time here and we never know when we might take our last breaths. And so I realized that I needed to listen to what this experience was telling me, that it was very important for me to not just keep going the way that I had been going, that I couldn't keep living the way that I had been and that I couldn't keep doing work that didn't align with my values and my desires to help people. And so this was, this event was a catalyst that made me realize that I needed to make some significant changes in my life and my career. And I wanted to help people in a well, in a way that felt right. And I really wanted to help people take responsibility for their own financial well-being and live further fuller and more satisfying lives to build wealth on their terms, not on the terms that like the bank or the investment management company, you know, on, not on their terms, but on the terms that made sense for each of us. And so I made this very difficult decision to leave, to quit my job and walk away from what I had built. And it was really, really hard. Like I cared so much about my clients and I wanted them to, you know, be able to get the best help possible. And at first I felt a lot of shame and embarrassment. Like I was giving up, like I should have been able to figure it out. And it took me a long time to talk about it. Here I am 10 years and, and I'm talking about it. I write about it a little bit in my book, but I decided that I was going to start my own company company focused on financial education and helping people get unstuck from their limiting beliefs about money. Um, this later became the foundation for my book, The Mindful Millionaire, and for my current work. I also want to mention like personal cost for a minute, because I think this is also part of, of what was going on. I always had a very, um, the kinds of jobs that you were full on, you know, like perfect for my type A personality, like work is everything. And for my entire career, I thought that I had to give everything to my work to be successful. And I missed out on so much family time over the years. I remember being here at Lake Tahoe and visiting a friend um, on a road trip. And we used to live here in Truckee. And we were at the lake for the day with the family and uh, a call came in and I had to break away and probably came back 30, 40 minutes later after negotiating through a situation. And my husband looked at me and he said, I wish I could take that cell phone and skip it across the lake because, you know, you are, you, the, this work is ruining our lives. Like you're, you're just not present. You're not present. You're not being the person that I know that you have the potential to be and and you're not being the parent that I know you want to be and he was right like I couldn't turn work off I couldn't stop making my clients and my work more important 
than my life. And I thought that was the price of success. And it, it makes me sad to think about all those years that I missed out on things because work took priority. I used to kid myself because I worked from home and I had a lot of flexibility. It was okay, but it really, it wasn't. So when I finally left, we had to make some big changes because after about a year in starting my company, it took a while to have things take off. And we realized that we didn't have like enough money to continue in the lifestyle that we had. And so we had to downsize. We had to sell our home and, and move away from the community that my kids had been growing up in. At that point, it didn't seem as hard as I thought it would have been because once I had made the change to leave the career, I realized that I was a lot stronger and being able to downsize and to make changes and to live even more frugally than we had lived in the past, uh, that, that we could do it. We could make it work. And so we sold everything off. We took my daughter to college. We took my son out of school for a year, right? Um, when he was like going into fifth grade and we took, we took this time to really live. We lived in Hawaii for a period of time. We traveled, we moved in with my in-laws and we made dinner and played games. And we just really took time to live. And it taught me just how much I had been missing out on my life. And so I definitely recommend a sabbatical if ever possible, because it is a game changer. It really does change your perspective on what it means to fully live. But what I just want to say in conclusion is by letting go of my career, I started living a fuller life. And I figured out how to be myself and how to be comfortable with, with myself. It, it's taken years to figure out how to be a business owner who can take care of myself and my family, but I've never been happier. And, you know, at first I was embarrassed to say that I was quitting without a plan, that I didn't really know how it was going to work out. But over time, it actually feels really good to say, I don't know what's next, but I know that I'm going to be okay. And I, I can't say enough about the confidence that, that we gain when we take care of ourselves and the things that are most important to us. And we, we put our family and our animals and our, um, our quality of life as number one. It's really freeing. And if you're in a similar situation, I want you to just know that it's okay not to have all the answers. So if you're in a situation that's similar to what I was living 10 years ago, it's okay. What matters is that you're taking steps towards creating a life that feels right to you. So I hope that sharing this is helpful to someone out there. Like if you're listening to this and you're feeling stuck or unhappy in your situation, I just want you to know that it's okay to make a change that you can trust your heart, you can trust your intuition when you know that things aren't right. And even if it's hard, and it probably will be, like it was not easy to do what I did. We humans are capable of adjusting to new situations better than we often give ourselves credit for. And so thank you for listening. I truly hope you have a wonderful day and I hope that you always remember to trust your heart. I know that your heart knows the way. Thank you.